I'm not holding this open all day. All right. <laughs> He's like, I see boobs. <laughs> <laughs> no, he sees an undershirt. He wants to see boobs. He does not want clothing. He wants bare skin. He's, oh my gosh, Chester. He's upset that it's not He's just a man's a man. <laughs> <laughs> And I want to know, like, how much does a toucan cost? Welcome back to the Para Podcast. I'm your host, Sandra. And today I have a very special episode for you. And I have to tell you, it's not about parrots, but it is another type of tropical bird. I know, I know it's the Para Podcast, but today we're going to be talking about toucans. Now, these tropical birds fascinate me, and I am keen to learn more. And today's guest is the owner of a toucan. Her name is Maria. Her toucan's name is Chester. If you don't already know them, Chester the toucan has got to be one of the cutest toucans I've ever seen, and he has stolen my heart. And so today we're going to jump in and talk with Maria about everything toucans. And I'm really excited to chat with Maria because before bringing a toucan home, she did a ton of research and she made sure that she knew as much as possible before adopting this bird and bringing them home. Now, any type of tropical bird that you're going to bring home, there's a lot of research to do. Before bringing any pet home, you need to do your research. But with tropical pets and exotic pets, this is especially important because their care requirements and their needs are quite complex. And I did a little bit of research on toucans. So I'm going to share with you that toucans make up the birds found in the re Ramphastidae family, and they are native to the tropical forests of Central and South America. They primarily inhabit rainforests, but can also be found in other types of forests. Their range extends from Southern Mexico to Northern Argentina, and they are particularly associated with the Amazon, but different species may have slightly different ranges within Central and South America. They are very intelligent birds, but they are also known for their bright colors and, of course, their big beaks. Toucans can live anywhere from 12 to 20 years, but it also depends on the type of toucan because there are small toucans, medium-sized toucans, and large toucans. And so we're going to chat with Maria and we're going to find out all about toucans. So let's jump in for this juicy toucan special. Well, Chester, I mean, he's free. He's in his cage right now, but he's free and about out and about. So I'm sure at some point he'll Oh, I can't okay. wait. Chester, yeah. I can't wait for you to come over here. Are you a little cutie? <laughs> He's been uh, a demon today. An absolute oh, really? demon. So, and again, on the other hand, it. this one's been an angel. She's being an <laughs> angel right now. Oh my goodness. I did not even see her. Oh. I know. <laughs> she literally does this on every podcast. And every time I'm on a Zoom call, she just like loves when I'm talking. I don't know. It like puts her to sleep and she snuggles into my hair and she naps for like two hours. That is so precious. I yeah, love she's literally like the most precious little bird. Um, please, I want to know what happened with oh Chester God. right before you jumped on. <laughs> okay, I have this big humidifier where there's like a base that you have to, you know, clean out and make sure it never gets mildewy or whatever. And then there's like the big tank of water you stick over that base and a lid. I took the big tank off to fill it with water. And while I'm filling it with water, Chester perched, I can, I get perched on this lamp right here above the humidifier and pooped the biggest blueberry poop in it, in the part that is supposed to be like the clean sanitary base of this whole thing to push the, the humidity out. So I had to like deep clean it to get his <laughs> poop out of it so I could put oh my this God. Thing back on top, so... I can't wait to get into toucan poops because I've been doing a ton of research on toucans to be ready for this episode. And I saw your reel on what toucan poops look like. And <laughs> I have learned quite a lot about toucans, but also that their poops are intense. If I thought parrot poops were bad, it's nothing compared to a toucan. Yeah, it's really interesting because I feel like parrot poop, which I've experienced way more in my life prior to Chester, it's pasty. It's similar to, you know, if you're dealing with like a pigeon or something and yeah. like I would always buy the product poop off to try to yeah. get stuff off of, um, you know, the cage or whatever. But with Chester, it's, it's not pasty. It's not necessarily hard to wipe off of a surface, 
it's very watery because it's most of their like the water they get is from the poop the the fruit. Let me say that again. <laughs> most of the water they get is from the fruit they eat. So their their poops are basically just like the fruit they ate 15 to 30 minutes ago. Yeah. And then a little bit of like watery substance. So cleaning it off isn't the problem, but the stains are so bad. Yeah. Are, are I can only imagine because he eats a lot of fruit. And whenever she has like a red pepper poop or like a raspberry or blueberry poop, it like, it, like if I'm wearing white, that's it. It's finished. There's going to be a stain. <laughs> and I have so many stains on my couch from those types of poops, but they don't happen that often. But before we get into poops, <laughs> I love how we're starting off. Um, I don't know if you can see him in there. Do you see him oh, in the yeah. back? Oh my God, Chester, come <laughs> here. I love you. I don't know why he's, I don't know why he's ever doing what he's doing. Okay. Well, I know you have experience with parrots and then Chester came into your life. So tell me a little bit about like your background with parrots before you got into toucans. So I grew up always visiting my aunt in New Jersey who had little parakeets. And when I was a little kid, I would go over there and get to hold a tiny parakeet with its tiny little body weight and its tiny little fingers and feet <laughs> around my hand. And I just, I thought that was the cutest thing, the best feeling. And every time I would go into town and get to see these little parakeets, I just, there was something about the weight of a little bird's body on your finger that, especially for a kid being so small and having such a small thing um, to, to play with was really fun. Um, and then when I got older and I was in high school, there was actually an ornithology class that my high school had that I could take. So I got to learn all about bird calls and about how to identify birds based on how they look, how they fly, their silhouette on a wire. And that really launched me into my love of birds where like it wasn't just about a pet parrot or something that I had met when I was a kid, but about really understanding like bird behavior and the difference between males and females. And this was a lot of, you know, just like songbirds backyard birds but I think yeah. that really that really grew my love and appreciation for birds more than I already loved them yeah and then so I went through a period where I was pretty depressed um after my dad passed away and after my sophomore year of college and I was moving back home to Georgia to kind of take some time and was trying to figure out things I could do to feel happier things I could do to brighten my life and there was a girl in one of my classes who had said, hey, you should really look into parrots. She suggested African greys, for example, saying they're really emotionally intelligent. A lot of people have really good therapy working with birds. You should look into local rescues. And so when I went back to Georgia um, after my sophomore year of college, I found this local rescue that was about an hour away from me. And I started volunteering there and meeting all these parrots and getting to really see not just all the different types of bird personalities, but how many of them get abandoned by owners who don't understand the commitment, the lifespan, how, I don't know, how complex they are as creatures. Yeah. You can't just like leave a bird in a cage. Yeah. It's not like that like you have to interact with them. You have to be really engaging. They're not decor. They're not decor. They're <laughs> not a cute little thing in a cage. Yeah. yeah. So that was, that was very eye opening uh, for me. And so I spent a lot of time just like finding any and all ways to play with birds, to meet different parrots, to like talk to other people about their experiences with birds. I had joined a bird club in Georgia. Like I had just immersed myself as much as possible. Um, and for a brief period of time, I was sort of like fostering a macaw. Um, it was only about six months though. Um, I had, it, again, it was a rough period in my life, but this was a, a small chunk of time I got to firsthand experience what it's like to be a parrot owner yeah. and learned a lot through that. And um, that definitely left me feeling like, okay, even more than before, I understand the responsibility of having a bird. I understand the responsibility of being like a parrot owner or um, taking in some, a creature that's a rescue that has a, a past and it's not just a baby that's been hand fed or something, you know, like you don't know the history of what happened to an animal before you get it a lot of the times. Yeah. Um, so it was, I think it was what, I guess 2021. I went to Costa Rica on a birding trip because I really wanted to go and just like see a lot of beautiful birds I'd never seen in the wild. 
And it was my first time ever seeing a toucan in the wild. And they were the big toucans you think of when you think of a toucan. The, the toco ones, right? Yeah, exactly. With yeah. the blue eyes and the orange beaks. I'm always like, oh my gosh, you're so pretty. <laughs> yeah, they're they're big and beautiful. And they would just be like sitting in trees the way you'd see a bunch of crows or sparrows or something. Like it was just a bunch of them huddled together in a tree while it's like raining outside super oh cute, God. super crazy. Like for me, such a surreal experience. Cause I just like wake up and look out on the balcony and just see a bunch of toucans flying by going in trees. It was incredible. Um, and to me, it was just like, this is a beautiful creature. It's something I've never seen before. It's amazing to see them in their natural habitat. But when I got back from that trip, I had been feeling like, you know what, since I moved up to the Virginia DC area, I haven't really had a lot of chances to interact with birds like I don't know people who have birds I don't I can't find any rescues to go volunteer at regularly um, there were a couple of local places I'd gone where I'd been able to interact with parrots but some were a little bit farther away and somebody told me that I should check out <laughs> this store in Falls Church that's name was literally parrots 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 just parrots was their official what a name, name. <laughs> which is wild and also misleading because it turns out it was not just parrots. It's like <laughs> oh the podcast. Gosh. It's not just parrots. Um, because toucans, I think I get I guess get lumped in sometimes. But yeah. I had gone there. I'd gone to the store being like, okay, I'm gonna go and play with some parrots that are, you know, 15 minute drive for me instead of a 45 minute drive. Um and, and this so store allows you to come in and interact and play with these parrots. That's yeah. awesome. Because there's not yeah. a lot of pet stores that do that. Oh, we have a visitor. Chester! Hello? Are you not getting oh attention right now? I am starstruck right now. Chester? What is it? Do you want to go on my shoulder? Do you want to go on my shoulder? What Hi, are you doing? Chester. You want to go on my shirt? I, I don't have the kind of shirt on. I don't have the kind of shirt on that you want to go in. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not. It's I know not he the, loves to go inside your shirt and like nest in there and take naps. He's thinking about it. He's looking. What are you going to do? I'm not holding this open all day. All right. <laughs> he's like, I see boobs. <laughs> <laughs> no, he sees an undershirt. He wants to see boobs. He does not want clothing. He wants bare skin. He's, oh my gosh. Chester. He's upset that it's not. He's just a man's a man. <laughs> yeah. He's like, what is this lady? I hear voices of another female. You know, it's funny. He, I have been on calls before on like Zoom or Teams yeah. with coworkers where we're, we're too, we're in a discussion for too long and Chester's annoyed. And he goes and he stabs with his beak right at the screen where the person's face is like very directly at the person trying to stab at them <laughs> on the screen. Oh my gosh. Good thing that there's a screen between him and that person. <laughs> <laughs> But he's like very aware. He he sees the screen. He sees the other person. So, so smart. They're so smart. <laughs> okay. We're trailing off topic. So you went to this bird store and you're like, I want to interact with the birds. By the way, I also wanted to say, I'm so sorry that you lost your dad. Oh, thank because you. I, I, I can only imagine the heartache. And so I'm, I'm really sorry that you went through that and I'm sending you all my love. Thank you. Yeah, it was it was definitely a rough time, but launched me into a lot of different interesting chapters as a result. So it's been yeah. I mean, it will be 10 years this May. So it's been a while now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah but I mean, it's still like when you I feel like when you lose a loved one like that, it it's something that never leaves you. It's always there. And so Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Um so I, I went into this, I went into this store thinking I was going to like walk around, maybe, maybe play with a, a cockatoo, a macaw, you know, the normal ones. And as I like make my rounds around the store, I'm walking towards the exit and I look and I see this little toucan in a little cage. And I'm like, there's no, like, there's no way this is a toucan. I've never seen a toucan that looks like this. It's tiny, but like the proportions of his beak, I, I was like, I mean, I, this has to be a toucan, right? So I asked the, the store owner and he was like, oh yeah, that's Chester. Um, he's He's been in here for a while now. His He had an owner, but she didn't want him anymore. And so now he's kind of like renting a cage in the store until we find the right, the right fit. 
So I, I loved, like, he was just so sweet. The owner said, you can open the cage. You could pet him if you want. Um, which to me, I loved that I was able to do that, but I also simultaneously hated that it meant this was something people were getting to do all the time, just like open yeah. cage or stick their hand in and, yeah. and pet a bird. Um, yeah. cause that feels a little bit against their will versus like yeah. a bird out that steps up on you. Yeah. But I ended up staying for four hours and I just like was petting him, like talking to him, just like watching his little routine. And I was, I mean, I was in love. I was like, I'm coming back tomorrow to see this bird again. (laughs) But very much to me, I was just like, oh, this is a bird I'm going to interact with. It's not like I'm about to go get a toucan because that's a a wild thing in my life that I was not planning on at that moment, was not planning on like everything that comes along with having a pet bird especially a species that I'd never really, I didn't know that much about toucans. Um, And so. What if he poops on the humidifier again? I swear to God, Chester, I swear. (laughs) Right over his butt is right over it. But at least like, I know that this will get your attention, both of your attentions. (laughs) (laughs) Now that you know what I'm capable of. (laughs) Um, and so I went back the next day and I was, I was playing with Chester again. I'd brought him blueberries and like, just wanted to interact with him as much as I could. And this woman working in the store comes over and she starts taking photos of him. And I'm like, Oh, what are you doing? Why are you taking pictures of Chester? And she said, there's a man who wants to buy him and he wants to know what he looks like. And that for me, it was like an instant protective sort of feeling, especially just like knowing how many people get birds thinking they're cool, exotic pets. Yeah. Yeah. Like if all you want is a photo of what a bird looks like, you're not even coming in to meet it. That just was a red flag for me. And it yeah. made me feel very um, de- like not defensive. What's the word? Protective. Yes. Thank you. It made me feel very protective. Like, no, Chester cannot, this sweet little creature cannot go to some home of what I imagine in my head being some man who's going to put this cage in like a basement or something and, you know, have, have him just sit in this cage and occasionally take him out and then forget about him and move on to get like an exotic snake. Like, you know, just, yeah. And I could be reading into it, but for me, I just felt like, oh my God, no, like Chester, Chester, the sweet little creature deserves a good home. So I ended up going home. Did you tell her, no, I want to buy him. (laughs) <laughs> no, not at that, not at that moment. No, I, um, I had to, I had to do some research cause I wasn't in an apartment that was pet friendly at the time. So I had to see if I could get him registered as an emotional support animal, which I mean, I knew my therapist would, would definitely see the benefit in that again, like birds just seem to be really good pets to have for, for that emotional support. Yeah. So he, he definitely would have, he fit the bill. Um, no pun intended. And um, I think that on that note, it's also important to note, especially for anybody who's listening, that they are very emotionally intelligent and they can be, you know, very helpful. But at the same time, you also have to do like what you did, do your research and also understand them so that it it becomes a relationship full of like harmony and trust and love and understanding rather than, you know, then behaviors coming out and you're constantly getting bit or something like that. And then you're like, what is this? (laughs) You know? So it's very important to also do that research. Yeah, I completely agree. I think, I mean, my biggest pet peeve with with people who become bird owners is the lack of everyone's living in the fantasy of what they think owning a bird is going to be, especially with social media, seeing these videos Mm -hmm. of what different parrots can do and say, and you're not paying attention to all the other things going along with it. I think a good example of this is um, Apollo, the, the African gray. I don't know if you've seen Apollo before. I think so. I think I've seen on social media. I'm not sure. I also follow Gizmo. That sounds, yeah, that sounds familiar too. Well, I just, I remember I was watching a bunch of Apollo's videos thinking like this bird's so smart. Like I love watching African greys really expand in their intelligence. And then I'm really looking at like different video clips and seeing 
the chewed parts of the bottom of the door and the wall and like all the things that they're not highlighting in their videos, but are part of that bird ownership. Like, yeah, your bird can do a lot of really cool things. And like the, the, what they're teaching Apollo and like the life he's getting is fantastic. But there is a bunch of stuff in that home that like a lot of people who like the idea of a bird would not like all of the other sort of consequences of, of yeah. owning yeah. owning a parrot that has that kind of bite force and can chew through things. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, like birds can be great emotional support animals if you're also going to be the right emotional support animal for them. It yeah. cannot go one way. Yeah. And they it's much a two-way bigger. relationship. I ultimately decided like, I really want to get Chester. So is it feasible to get Chester? And what in my life am I going to have to change to make this work for both of us? So I, I started that. doing research and it turns out there's not a lot of research or blog posts or articles or anything about toucan ownership in captivity. Cause it's just not a common thing. Yeah. Um, it's not like when you do research on parrots. And so even trying to figure out things like what's toxic to a toucan it might be different than what's toxic to a parrot. So just like figuring out those lists took a lot of time. So I read a couple of blog posts, contacted the people who had written them. And then ultimately I got turned on to a Facebook group called Toucans, Toucanets, and Aracaris, or Arasari is the other way to pronounce it. Um, and I joined this group, put a message in there to all these people who are basically toucan experts, toucan owners, people who know their toucan stuff. And I said, Hey, I'm looking into getting this bird. I want to understand what the responsibilities are. I want to understand the diet, like anything I'm going to need to know to be a good owner. And they, they were phenomenal. They helped me so much with really understanding like the medical considerations, like iron storage disease is something that toucans deal with a lot where their bodies just aren't able to process iron well. So you have to make sure that they're not consuming citrus or anything that might make it harder for them to process the iron you have to be very considerate and mindful of what they're consuming and how much iron content is in each item they're consuming you have to give them these low iron soft bill pellets that are created um, specifically for two cans and I also have a very expensive tea called iron out that I give Chester about once a week in his water um, as something to also just help with the iron processing. So unfortunately, wow. a lot of toucans die early from iron storage disease or hematomacrosis. Um, and so that's been something that just like constantly stresses me out, especially because in this toucan Facebook group, they talk a lot about um, research into toucans in captivity and dying and like their lifespan and stuff. And it seems like it's a range. Some people's toucans live to be seven, nine 10, 17, I don't think I've heard of a single one living more than, you know, the lifespan of a cat or a dog. Um, yeah. Chester's already, he's almost seven. So for me, it's so scary just feeling like, you know, you can do everything you possibly can to try to protect your animal. But this is a, this is a wild exotic animal living in captivity. Yeah. Being genetically modified food because all of the fruit, even if you buy the most organic stuff, like all it's of not our what fruit, it is in the Amazon. Exactly. <laughs> we are, we are getting some imported American products that are just, you know, this is not what they should be eating. So, yeah. um, I, so I really looked into how much it was going to cost diet wise. Uh, it's a lot of fruit and it has to be a range of fruit, like quite the variety all the time. Um, how many different of, fruits does he eat like a day? Um, let's see today, or I guess yesterday he had papaya, cantaloupe, blueberry, green grape, purple grape. Did I say banana? You didn't. Uh, banana, strawberry, dark cherry, cucumber. <laughs> like, it's just like, he, yeah, I, that's I, a <laughs> lot of different fruits a day. I, give I think him in like my past a, life, I might've been a toucan because I love fruit. <laughs> Chester is, he he loves, I mean, he loves all the fruit he gets, but his favorite thing is when he's eating something he thinks he's not allowed to have. So for example, <laughs> like- Sounds like of, parrots too. <laughs> <laughs> right, like like any any pet. 
um they want what they can't have but yeah. like I'll, I'll have like a piece of lettuce sometimes and he will just I mean it is the most exciting thing to him to like grab a piece of lettuce and like steal it from my plate and eat it and it's of like all zero things, calories. lettuce it doesn't <laughs> I, even have a taste <laughs> but it's crunchy and it's strange and it's different and it feels forbidden to him yeah so he loves getting lettuce oh my gosh what's his favorite fruit sometimes I think that like hands down if if he had to pick one fruit to eat forever it's blueberries I knew it I think he likes that they're small they don't get cut up he can just eat it as is um he can chuck them in his mouth like I've seen toucans do in the wild with different berries where they just like toss them back Um, so he just like swallows it whole like you're you're like you're taking an ibuprofen or something yeah popping an Advil he doesn't do anything with it the only time I really see him like try to mush something up in his beak is if it's like he's stolen a piece of banana or he's stolen a piece of papaya where it's really big and he's trying to like mash it down a little to be able to swallow it okay but or he'll whip it like he'll have the piece of fruit and he can feel that like a part of it's dangling out so he'll whip his his beak back and forth and it'll fly across the room so he has a smaller piece to consume which is a huge mess. I mean, like if you look at just like this wall, I don't know if you can see all those yeah, different I see. And smudges, but I'm constantly cleaning it and it's always getting messy again. Like he's whipping stuff all over the place or like juicing pomegranates where he's just <laughs> whip squishing, it like, real good. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the song <laughs> in Chester's head. <laughs> That's so funny. I should make a, I should make a video with that sound in the background. (laughs) I love it. Um, you said that Chester is now seven years old. How old was he when you got him? So he's going to, he's roughly seven. I know that he was born in 2017 because it was on the band from the place he was raised in captivity, which is Emerald Forest Bird Gardens in California. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have his exact birthday and they can't find a record of it. So I don't know his exact birthday, but when I got him, he was four. So okay. he was about, about four years old, but I, okay. I don't know when he was born. So his gotcha day with me, which is May 31st is what I have just made his birthday. Yeah. So he will be, he will be seven in May. Cute. And Arcarius? Arcarius. Arakari or Arasari. Arakari. Okay. Arakari uh, toucans. I read that their lifespan is like eight to 12 years. Is that right? I mean, again, it seems like there's just not a ton of data. So yeah, I read online that like in general, they can live 12 to like 20 years, but I think it also depends on the species and size. Right. Uh, You know, it's interesting because it seems like some of the data online for our our Akaris is suggesting a shorter lifespan. But then like now in captivity, the bigger toucans mm-hmm. are the ones experiencing diabetes and it's not reported yet in our Akaris that I've I've seen anywhere. So it seems like the lifespan might be shrinking for the bigger ones before it's, I guess what yeah. I'm trying to say is like, it just doesn't seem like there's enough data period yeah. to really nail down a lifespan. Yeah. And yeah. so all the time in my, in my toucan Facebook group, I'm, I'm seeing posts with these surveys being like, please, if you have any information on your toucan, like their lifespan, when they died, any information, we would love it. We're trying to really collect research on this. So yeah, it's an ongoing conversation. Yeah, I think that's the thing, like with exotic pets, I think it's the same thing kind of with parrots. There's a, there are researchers out there, but I don't think there's enough research because they haven't been pets for all that long. Like definitely not as long as like dogs or cats or even probably rabbits or having, you know, a farm with chickens and pigs. So they're undomesticated, you know, animals. And so the research is like constantly being done to find out more about them. Um, But I wanted to circle back because you told us that you decided that you wanted to bring Chester home and you did a ton of research. You joined this Facebook group. You found it as much as you could. And then what? Well, I approached the bird store owner who connected me with Chester's former owner. Um, She's this very nice woman. She lives locally and 
so I talked to her directly. I talked to her about like who Chester was, why she was giving him up, um, and what she was sort of looking for out of a new owner. And we, we got along, she seemed very, very comfortable with the exchange. So I, like I paid her directly for him. She also gave me a very, this cage is a very, very nice cage that she still had in her home from a year earlier when she had first given Chester up and yeah. he gave me this with Chester. So overall he was a bargain, yeah, um, but still very expensive. Um, and so I had to get order. I had to get a U-Haul to get this thing into my apartment. It is huge. It does not fit in an SUV of any size. It is a U-Haul sort of um, <laughs> delivery yeah, size. <laughs> and so I picked Chester up. It was I was supposed to get him early June, but I was flying home. I was flying from Atlanta, where my mom lives, back to the DC area on May 31st in 2021. And I called up the store and I was like, Hey, can I just get him right now? Like, could I just go pick him up like an hour after getting home from the airport? And I already had the carrier that I'd ordered from Amazon to be able to like transport him. And so I went into the store, I scooped him up and put him in the little carrier and we stopped by Target on the way home because that was like the closest thing that was a grocery store. And I didn't want to leave him in the in the car for too long. And I like grabbed some berries from from Target and like some banana and a couple of fruits uh, for him. And then we drove home and I let him out. And he just kind of like, well, the first thing he the first thing he did when I opened up and unzipped his little carrier was he hopped up on my arm. And I was you guys like, fell in oh. love. <laughs> like it was it was such a it was such a precious moment I was like oh my god the there's trust already being built here if he feels comfortable enough to just hop right up so I think it was also a bit of a a relief and a confusing moment for him of like where am I now what am I doing here who is this lady that keeps visiting me that now has snatched me up and taken me out of here <laughs> but now he's got this not here but the old apartment now he's got this whole apartment that he's just like looking around and trying to figure out what to do. So he's just like hopping around on the ground. He doesn't really fly at first. He's just kind of like peeking and poking around. And I had put some newspapers on the top of the cage, just kind of like, I don't even know how to describe it. They were just like laying on the top, but sort of almost in a, a tent shape by accident. Yeah. I remember later that night, I was just sitting on the couch, um, talking to a friend and I look up and I'm like, where's Chester? And I looked at the cage and I was like, oh my God, he's hiding under the newspaper. And I thought, oh my gosh, he's scared or something. Like what's like, what's going on? Why is Chester under these newspapers? And after about a week of every single night finding him under newspapers, I sent, I posted something in the Facebook group being like, can anybody explain this behavior? What's going on? And I get this flood of responses of all of these toucan owners, especially other Arakari owners who have tiny little huts and tiny little, you know, small cavity spaces yeah. to house their birds in at night because they love sleeping in small cavities, like a dead, a dead tree cavity or something in yeah. the wild. Their natural instinct is to like cozy yeah. up in, in a small cavity. And so I immediately ordered something on Amazon and it was like, okay, well, I'm definitely going to get him his own little nest. Um, yeah. he hopped in right away, loved it. Uh, then the whole hormone journey started of me realizing he cannot have access to a nest 24 seven, or he thinks it's time to breed. So <laughs> what are two can hormones like, um, are they as like intense as parrot hormones? He is Chester is so possessive of me. He very quickly decided we are partners. Like I am his life I am his other half he is scared of other birds I think again because he was in this bird store for a year I think it just really like he wasn't it doesn't seem like he was allowed out ever Aww. but parrots were allowed out and these cockatoos and macaws would like I witnessed it like they would fly and smack into his cage and Chester would bounce around on the inside like in a panic oh my so I think he's scared of birds and doesn't understand he's a bird so I am, I am his partner. He does not understand we are different creatures. Yeah. Um, and so 
yeah, hormones. I mean, he's he's attacked a couple of people who've come over before, like gone for their eye. I've I've rejected him before and he's gone and tried to bite my eye. It's very and he, he knows what to go for. He knows. Oh, it's he's always like, I will eye. take your sight. <laughs> <laughs> you will not see if you do not see me. <laughs> there was this one really terrible time where like where I had had three of my my coworkers and like best friends over um to work from home together one day and Chester was out loose he seemed fine but he had been like screaming a little bit and doing some alert calls but I thought he was just being dramatic um I didn't really think he was going to go after anybody he's seen these people a million times he knows my coworkers but my female coworker was sitting on the couch over there just on her computer we're all in silence working on our computers and all of a sudden Chester goes from over in my kitchen across here and darts directly for her and gets her right by her eye like so close to her eye like he did a direct attack and I know it's because he planned it out too he from a distance it and he was like I'm gonna get her I'm gonna get mom's attention or Maria's attention my partner's attention I don't know what I am it's an Oedipus complex <laughs> situation but he was like I'm gonna get her attention by going after this girl and he was right I mean, I immediately was like, oh my God, like freaked out, went over to make sure she was okay, put Chester in his cage, did not let him out again. Um, like he got he got the attention he was looking for, but at the price of my poor, poor friend and coworker. Did, did her like inner eye like bleed or like bruise or anything? She was bleeding like right on the edge. It didn't get he did not get her eye, but he did get like very close to it. And the, the skin okay. there is so thin and sensitive. Yeah. Uh, that, a couple of times Chester's gotten me near my eye. I mean, it stings. It is not a good oh, feeling. Dang. Oh. oh my gosh. So how do you deal with a toucan's hormones? And what, like, is he also hormonal in spring or is like toucan hormones different than Bre a parent? Breeding season, which I believe for him is about April through September, mm. um, is definitely more noticeable. He's a little friskier, um, <laughs> trying to... <laughs> Check. trying to, to procreate more. Um, and I have to, I have to really distract him from that, give him toys, you know, things to forage for all of yeah. that. Get but that I will energy say, out in a different way. Exactly. You just have to really, um, redirect the energy. Yeah. But, but I would say year round, I have to watch him and make sure he's not going to go after anybody. I'm, I don't even think it's necessarily hormones, more just like territorial in general, um, yeah. and he just, he wants to make sure that there's nothing threatening our, our bond. Yeah. I actually wanted to ask you also about this sleep. So I know that they like to sleep in these cavities and in the wild, they sleep in these cavities and these dead trees, but it triggers his hormones. So he can't have these nests all the time. So when he doesn't have the nests and you remove them, where does he sleep at night? Does he sleep in his cage? So Chester always has his nest for sleep. He always oh, has okay. to go into, but I avoid him being able to access it during the day oh. because he'll, he'll go like, look up and he always does the same thing with his head. He like goes back and forth with his beak in his head like this, looking in and making these tiny little honks and then hops in like, all right, it's time. Like, let's go. And I, <laughs> first of all, again, he doesn't <laughs> understand. I cannot fit. And um, that that is not what's happening. So he just really can't be reminded of um his like sleeping nest so it, it really truly really is just sleep for him and he knows that he knows to go in at night he like that is his space he goes to sleep in and he's in there all night till he wakes up in the morning and that's in my bedroom he sleeps on my dresser that whole dresser is like his space and um we can see each other at night like he could peek out and are sleep. you ever worried that like at night he's gonna like come out and start like exploring or like chewing things he's not supposed to or like dive bomb your eye <laughs> no, what, what I have learned about Chester is when he is out, he is out. Like if he goes to bed, he's not waking up. He's, you're not going to get him up. He is going to like huddle in, stick his little butt feathers up. So they're like straight up in the air and like, you could do anything to him. And he's just going to pretend like he doesn't even realize you're there. Like it's so crazy because all he takes the sleep seriously. Oh, he's in the sink right now. What are you doing? <laughs> get out of there oh my god he oh, is god. all over the place he's full of energy two cans are energy birds 
they are very energetic and they have very short attention spans. Um, so like training, training with him is, I mean, I can maybe get his attention for like 30 seconds. Yeah. I saw that actually on your blog. I was reading the one, um, the differences between parrots and toucans and we'll get into more of those, but I'll let you, let you finish. Yeah. Sorry. Just like Chester, I'm, I'm going in way too many directions. (laughs) with what we're talking about you guys have been Um, hanging out too much (laughs) um no when he when he's like going to sleep he's he's out he's he's conked um so i'm sorry i don't know what he's doing um but like for example if if my coworkers or my friends whoever is here during the day and they go and try to touch chester he's gonna zoom away or he's gonna bite them he's gonna be like leave me alone why are you bothering me yeah. If Chester's in his nest and somebody sticks their hand in to pet him, he's honking, he's loving it, he's just accepting it. He's like sleepy and just kind of there. Like he's a completely different creature if he is in sleep mode. Sleep oh mode Chester is an angel. Daytime <laughs> Chester is a demon. I love it. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's like a, a switch flips. Yeah. Yeah. He's, I mean, good for him. He can go to sleep so well. Like, yeah. Mom. he we've had the fire alarm go off in the middle of the night and i can't get him out of bed like i have to scoop him up and stick him in the carrier so we can exit my apartment he's not getting up when there's a blaring fire alarm at two in the morning he's just, just like, like a teenager yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a teenager that's been drinking all night and completely yeah. knocked out <laughs> and does he sleep in with you or does he wake up early he they say that they're they're a sundown to sun up <clears throat> bird, just like I think any birds. And I know that a yeah. lot of people cover the they'll cover the cages of their parrots at night, um, yeah. so that they're you know sleeping and not being disturbed by the sun. But Chester basically is on my sleep schedule. He might sleep for a couple hours more on the the front end, like I'll maybe be in bed reading or watching something, and he's already put himself to bed. Um, but he usually wakes up either at the same time as me or right before me around like between like eight and nine 30, depending on the day he sleeps really well. And he, he doesn't get up at like, you know, 5.00 AM. Like I see a lot of posts from different bird owners and other toucan owners talking about the early hours of the morning, they're being woken up. And I just don't have that situation with Chester. We we don't sleep in a bedroom where a lot of sunlight's coming in. Yeah. I think it's like, west facing or something i don't know i don't know anything when people are like go west on this street east is that way head north i'm like where where is that (laughs) the only reason i know about directions when it comes to apartments is because the south facing like the southern exposure apartments are always the most expensive and hardest to find because you get sunlight all day Mm. and if you get a west facing apartment you're only getting sun at the end of the day when the sun's setting which sucks and that's where Chester and I were when I first got him. And it was not enough sun oh, for, gotcha. for me and Chester. So like, I'm very aware now of like the direction of an apartment's, you know, walls yeah. and facing. <laughs> um, but yeah, he sleeps in. He's a really good sleeper. And there have been a couple of times where I've been hung over and I am out cold and it's like 11 in the morning and Chester's been entertaining himself for hours, just kind of like sitting there watching me sleep. And so finally he gets sick of it and he'll, he flies over onto my head and just starts like bothering me or like waking also, you like, up. <laughs> yeah. He's just like, I'm done. I am done watching you sleep. Get up. It's time to start the day. And he will. Yeah, let's start the day. I want some fruit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. Okay. And also I want to know, is there sleeping time, like similar to parrots? Like, do they sleep like 12 hours? I would say Chester sleeps about 10. Okay. Yeah, I think that's on par with parrots. I think it depends on the parrot, maybe on the season, but they need like 10 to 12 during hormonal season. They say like even 13, 14. Um, Okay. Now, because we were talking about sunlight and you got an apartment with all the sun, um, I saw that toucans, when they're sunbathing, they look, (laughs) I don't even know the word, ridiculous. (laughs) Like, I was like, is he okay? And then I read that, you know, toucans, when they're sunbathing, they just look like this. They, they, you describe it. (laughs) Yeah. I always, I've always called it gargoyle mode. 
because he just reminds me of like a gargoyle statue of like some creepy creature and the way he just like freezes in place too like the first couple times he did it I didn't understand what he was doing. And I You're like, again, Facebook was, group, what is this? Yep, I went to the Facebook group and I was like, what's going on? <laughs> and then I saw a lot of photos of what other um, toucans look like when they're sunbathing. And they're like possessed by the sun. They're like, ah. And it, they look dead sometimes. Like I have had, the first time I took Chester outside where he had, he had like all the sunshine. It was like a perfectly, you know, it wasn't too hot of a day. He was in his little carrier cage for sunbathing so he could be outside. And he was flat on the ground with his eye open. And I was like, the bird looks dead. Like he does not look like he's alive right now. And I sent a photo in the Facebook group. And again, I get, I get this string of responses of what look like dead toucans in little carrier cages outside, all sunbathing. They just like lay flat and have their eye open, like with this crazy look in their eye. Oh my gosh. Their open, their feathers puffed up. And they just will stay still like that and sunbathe. It's it's the weirdest thing. How long does he sunbathe for? Like, when is he like, I have enough? So even within our apartment, like when the sun's coming through later in the day here, it will be warm enough that he can sunbathe here. And I've seen him do it for maybe like 15, 20 minutes at the most. Outside, okay. if it's really hot, it d- really depends on like the temperature. I don't want him to get overheated. Mm-hmm. So sometimes he only sunbathes for like, five minutes or something yeah Um, it really just depends on like what he can tolerate I never want him to to have and when you when you take him outside do you always have him in a carrier Chester what are you doing now (laughs) chewing chewing up a plant for attention he is so mischievous (laughs) he's always up to something he is constantly on the move (laughs) this is life with a toucan they're messy they're always on the move. They're clumsy, full of energy, chaotic. Yeah, I think the funniest thing about his clumsiness is like he knows how long his beak is. He yeah. knows he knows he has a big beak. But most of the time when he flies and lands, he smacks his beak down when he lands, like as if he doesn't he hasn't figured out how he needs to land so this doesn't happen. Is he- I want to know about his flying. Like, is he a graceful flyer or like, is he fast? Like, does he like, tell me about his flying. Chester does small bursts of flying. He's basically a point A to point B sort of flyer. He's He's like, I want to get here. I'm swooping over and that's it. I'm landing, crash landing with my beak. There have been a couple of times where in the hallway here, I've let him out and he's just gone and zoomed down the hallway But I see the way he flies and he really, he doesn't soar. He doesn't have the ability to, to do these like long sort of soaring journeys. It's more like lots of flaps, kind of like doggy paddling is like his style of flying. (laughs) Um, So it's lots of flapping and not very long distances he can go. So very different from parrots. (laughs) Yeah. Very different from like, you know, seeing a macaw soar outside and I know you asked earlier, um, he is either in a carrier cage outside or he is on a leash and harness. He is never free. I don't think he remotely under would understand what to do if he were free. I think he would fly in a panic with tunnel vision and get eaten immediately by a crow, a hawk, something. Yeah, that's I'm terrifying. not risking it. I'm yeah. not risking it by letting him free fly. He does not have the mental ability, I think, that like a macaw <laughs> might have. Yeah. To be able to successfully do this without getting himself killed. Do you know, like, even in the Facebook group, like, any toucans that are free-flighted? Or is that not really a popular thing with toucans? That's a good question. I don't remember seeing anybody with a free-flying toucan. Okay. So um, good- I know that you also, you have a harness for him and you mentioned that. But it's different than the parrot harnesses. It's a leather harness. Why did you get this harness and how did you train him to like get into it? And is he comfortable with it? So the, the harness is called leathers for feathers. It's from Etsy. Cute. I know it's so cute. The reason that he's able to have the leather harness is because toucan beak strength is not the same as parrot beak strength. They don't, parrots have to be able to crack nuts. They have to be able to undeshell something. Yeah. Chester just has to be able to smush fruit. 
Like yeah. that's a com- completely different strength. So if you put leathers for feathers products on um, a, a cockatoo, uh, an African gray, a macaw, they would snap the leather so quickly. Like that, that's not a product that would survive a yeah. parrot's strength. Yeah. Uh, but with Chester, it's great. It's the way that, actually, I'll pull it out so you can see what it looks like. He does, he does not like the harness in theory. Once it's on him, he doesn't care, but he does not like the process because I put it over his beak and he hates anything that has to go over the beak. Um, Does he bite you when you're trying to put it on? I mean, yeah, he'll fly away for sure. But once he, usually first couple times of like the spring and summer, he's more resistant because he's like, oh God, this thing again. And then he he gets at the program. What I've learned is like, if he's calm, if I, if I'm petting him and then we start the process, he doesn't really resist as much. He's like, okay, I know what's going on. But if I catch him when he's already kind of like frantic and, you know, going all about, like, he doesn't like the idea of the harness coming out. So it's really more about like his mood and his, the way, the way he's feeling at that moment. So this is the harness and it's great because you can, which is what I do. Um, stick it right over the beak to put it on yeah and hook it behind their back legs like this but it's so you simple perfect... you don't have to like put it over his feathers or anything yeah you well I mean you're basically just like putting it around the wings like behind the back legs it's really easy but you can also okay. snap this and so you can hook it on in a way that does not have anything going over their beaks or their heads if that's something that scares them yeah, uh, the way that it's designed is really nice because there's no way they could accidentally choke themselves in it if they somehow were, you know, pulling it half off or like got stuck. Whatever they could do to themselves, they just can't choke themselves in it. So that's a that's a huge a huge plus that uh, drove me to get this one. And again, Toucan Facebook group is where I learned about this product. So they have been such a a resource for me. Amazing. And was it like a lot of training to get him comfortable with it? Or was it like pretty quick? Oh, yeah, a lot of training. It was a lot of positive reinforcement, giving him treats. Um, What's a toucan treat? (laughs) More fruit? Raspberries. I would say like raspberries, while he gets them often, he can never get enough. Oh, it's a or blueberries. raspberry or bl- blueberries yes but there's something about a raspberry even though I think blueberry is his favorite hands down there's something about a raspberry that is like it like it just has Chester's heart he's, <laughs> he's obsessed with them okay and when you take him out with the harness because I know um that you mentioned that he is very possessive of you and he attacks people and I also saw on your social media that like your family your sister your friends if anybody was to come over, like they're likely getting attacked. But if you take him out, like I saw that he was in the cockpit at Delta. He was with some DJ at like a bird bar and he's just hanging out. So when you guys are in public, like, is he more keen to go to other people or does he still attack? Yeah. So when Chester's in his own space, his own domain, like here, this is his kingdom. Yeah. He knows he's in charge. It's a dominance thing. It's a possession thing. He's very safe and comfortable. Yeah. When we're anywhere else, whether it is because he's on a leash and harness or we are visiting someone else's home, like going to my mom's for Thanksgiving in Atlanta, he acts differently. He's a lot more shy with his behavior. He's not squawking often. He's not really making any noises at all. Um, he's He'll step up on people. He'll accept treats or pets from people more. Um, so he's just, he's very different. It's it's specifically within the this like space that is His ours. Home. Yeah, that, that he acts okay. that way, which I get. I, I mean, it's territorial. Yeah. Speaking of noise, I love the honks. <laughs> the honking I'm like oh my gosh you're so cute I can't handle it but tell me how loud do toucans get and in comparison to parrots like would you say that they're louder or quieter and what other than his honks and squawks like is there any other sounds that he makes so parrots are definitely louder parrots uh have much higher I don't know what it is decibels like yeah decibels there whatever a parrot is able to reach is much worse on your eardrums yeah <laughs> i i can't speak for the big toucans um since i don't really know how 
how loud they could get or what noises they would make as alarm calls. But the loudest Chester gets is like a full on like intruder alert alarm call where he does not want somebody there and he's going to scream about it and let you know. It Mm. isn't painful to your ears. I've never had a noise complaint, but it is annoying if he doesn't stop. So he can just go on and on and on and on and not, and not stop. Chester though. Ch- oh, he's about to take a bath. I think. Yeah. There's about Your to be a Your neighbors lot know that you have a toucan without telling them. Yeah, they know. I, I mean, I told people are very okay. aware of the complex of me and Chester. <laughs> I love it. Oh, um, I can, I can pull him out of there if you want. Cause he's definitely about to make a lot of background noise. That's like fine. he's about to take a bath. Yeah, that's fine. Let him make all the noise he wants. It's the parrot podcast. It's supposed to be noisy. (laughs) (laughs) And after he's done bathing, does he go sunbathe? Sometimes, yeah. And they look dry off. The the sun's about to be the right time of day for sunbathing. So does he take a bath every single day? Basically, yeah. It's rare he skips a day. Okay. He's doing it. Oh, he's having a jolly old time. I Okay, so I want to talk about his enclosure. So this is a really large cage. And for anybody who's listening, if you are thinking about getting a toucan or you're in the process of adopting a toucan, you need a very large enclosure. What would be like your recommendation for a cage for a toucan? Well, what you really have to consider with toucans is they don't use their feet and their beaks the way that parrots do parrots do a lot of climbing yeah they do a lot of walking yeah toucans just hop they only hop so they need to be able to hop up and down left and right you need a big space for them to hop Um, okay and chester again he's very small this is a a large cage period but he is a smaller toucan if this were a like a huge one of the big toucans that a lot of people think of when they think of a toucan this cage would not suffice it would need to be at least twice as big yeah like maybe like those macaw massive aviaries right exactly yeah because they need to they need to be able to go up and down left and right hopping they need lots of different size perches lots of different levels to go on um and so yeah, Chester's, I mean, Chester's cage goes almost all the way to the floor here. Yeah. So it's pretty big. Yeah. Um, I wanted to go back to his beak because I know, so you told me that he hops around and he uses his beak a lot. How much does Chester weigh? And like, is his beak heavy or is it light? His beak is very light. Um, I think it takes up like 40% of his body or something like that, I read. I mean, yeah, he's like, he's all feathers and like skin and bones. Like he's such a, he's such a tiny creature. He doesn't even weigh a pound. Um, he's, he's less than a pound. What? Yeah. That's nuts. They are really light. I mm-hmm. I was reading about like toucans and aracarias. Aracaris. Aracaris and toucanets, the small ones. And the toucanets, there's like a pocket toucan that weighs like half a pound or less than half a pound. And I'm like, that's crazy. And the largest ones only weigh like four pounds. So I was like, I wonder how much Chester weighs. It's funny you say there's like a pocket toucan because I've I've seen a lot of videos in the toucan Facebook group of these, this one couple that um, they have two toucanets and they will be in like the sweatpants pockets all the time and stuff, just like popping their heads out or hopping in. And Chester's a little too big for a sweatpants pocket. (laughs) Oh my gosh. And with his beak, like what is his bite strength? Like, does he have strong bites? And I've seen that he's like bit your feet and you told us that he's like gone to bite people's eyes. Like do his bites hurt? And what is the bite in comparison to like a parrot? So again, talking about a toucan bite here, we're talking about an aracari. So I cannot vouch for the big ones. Yeah. Chester, um, his bites really don't hurt at all. What hurts is if he bites you like by your eye or one time he bit my sister's ear and dangled off her earlobe. So, I mean, he might be less than a pound, but being like holding on to an earlobe and dangling from it, that, that hurts. But more than anything, it's scary. If you're not expecting a bite and you come, he comes at you and you get bitten, 
it's it's more like a jarring thing than it is um than it is like something that you know is particularly painful oh i'm just looking at your bird <laughs> this is mia her name's mia yeah my she my up, so now Mia. she's like now I'm gonna be mischievous. Let me go for the plant <laughs> instead of the dill. She's been obsessed with this um like whatever plant is in here. So I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna put some herbs in there because before she would never touch it. So today I put some herbs in there and I'm like, let me put dill since it's your favorite and you can nibble on that. So no, so she goes to this side. She's like, oh, we've got this over here. Oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um sorry you were saying about his uh beak strength so he, if he tries to bite me with all his might like he he will try so hard to bite down on my finger or something and it's just it says it doesn't hurt like it's no it's not that it's perfectly comfortable but it's almost comical how much he tries to do damage sometimes and he just really doesn't succeed he he feels just like a chihuahua I think he feels like a lot mightier than he is and he he really does not do a lot of damage um if he gets you at you know the wrong spot or just like with the tip of his beak like kind of pinching you if you pinch somebody hard enough you'll probably break some skin yeah but if you overall <laughs> yeah exactly yeah so overall like i would say his his bites really aren't that bad the bite strength is so weak in comparison to a parrot so it it's it's definitely a huge difference from like a macaw bite where I would have like these big bruises and like big, you know, bloody cuts all over yeah. my Yeah. So when he's like attacking your feet or, you know, going at your fingers, it's like, in like, what would you compare it to? Like tongs? No, I would say it's, it's like a pinch. It's like if somebody's pinching you. Oh, okay. So if you don't like the feeling of someone like, you know, going like that to your skin if, if you don't like the feeling of being like yeah nails yeah so it's like you feel it it's not like a dull tongue but it's not particularly uncomfortable okay right and tongue. I also saw that a toucan's tongue is very strange I was looking at it and I'm like it just looks like a really thin like the inside of a feather Yes. Yeah. It looks like a feather. It's the full length of their beak and they easily break off parts of their tongue, but it regenerates. Okay. So Chester will sometimes play too hard where he's like opening his beak and chewing on something and he's not paying attention to where his tongue is. So the tongue is like flopping to the side and bending because of what he's chewing on. And so then it just bends, cracks, breaks off. And now his tongue is shorter. And he doesn't even seem bothered by it. He doesn't seem to notice that he's broken off part of his tongue. He just keeps going on and playing. It's incredible. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's nuts. Um, and speaking of like him eating with his tongue and all that, actually, I wanted to ask you, because I think that this is also a question that a lot of people ask online is, do toucans have talking abilities? But because of the way that their tongues are shaped, it's nothing like a parrot's. So I'm going to think maybe not. Yeah. Two, two kids are not able to talk. Um, they don't have any ability to, to mimic or parrot like a parrot. Um, oh, wow. She's really getting in that plant. She is usually never like this. <laughs> Chester's a bad influence. Yeah. Mia, what is going on? <laughs> <sighs> um, two kids cannot talk. They only do sort of like a range of vocalizations from like sort of chattier, like little sounds to bigger squawks for warning calls, but they don't make noise for the sake of making noise. Like they make noise with a purpose. So I think a lot of parrots um, or songbirds, whatever, like there's, there's singing, there's squawking, there's all sorts of different chatter for just like the sake of being loud and annoying. Yeah. I think birds entertain themselves by doing that a lot of the time. Yeah. Toucans seem to be pretty quiet unless they've got something to say. Very interesting. And it, now you have experience with parrots and a toucan. So I want to know, do you think that toucans and parrots would get along or do they get along? I feel like it's try, like trying to have a cat and a dog get along. 
Okay. With yeah. like an energetic golden retriever being a parrot <laughs> and like an older grumpy Mr. cat, grumpy cat being a toucan. <laughs> I feel like they can get along. There can be overlapping personalities, but like Chester, how do I describe this? Like Chester doesn't, he doesn't have fun. He doesn't play. He doesn't do all these things that you think of that like parrots really enjoy. Chester doesn't care about music. He's just like occasionally wanting to destroy something, occasionally wanting to like, you know, chew something up. So maybe you can consider that playing, but like. But not nearly not really... as playful as a parrot. Yeah, there, there, he doesn't have that that element to his personality. And he's not, he doesn't dance to music. I've never seen a toucan dance to music. They just seem to be on a different wavelength of how they're processing their environments. So I feel like if I were a toucan, if I were Chester, I would be annoyed at a parrot's energy level and sort of like, mischievous playful behavior all the time yeah I don't know that, that would just be my best guess does but he never... like to play with toys like do you get him a lot of toys and does he like destroy them quickly or do they last long I have purchased hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth of toys for Chester everything from like you know range of bird toys to baby toys to just like you know random little things I think he's gonna enjoy he goes for garbage. He likes the things in my trash and recycling. He likes the the items he's not supposed to have. He does not care about any of the toys. I have boxes of toys for him. I will try to pretend that the toy is not a toy, but it's like he knows. <laughs> he wants the empty plastic cup or the straw. He doesn't want like the very colorful toys with bells and whistles. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So he just finds his own entertainment. He's like, yeah, you can and- spend all the hundreds of dollars that you want, but I want this paper towel roll. Yeah. Yes. And he loves paper towel rolls. Um, and he apparently also- chewing and destroying all of your plants. <laughs> yeah. Something that seems to be one of the, the biggest points of entertainment for toucans is taking items and smacking them against the surface to see what they sound like. I don't know if that comes from something in the wild of wanting to hear if something's hollow, knowing if there's something inside it you could get. I don't know where it's coming from, but I have seen this across all sorts of videos of different toucans. They like to take things and then just smack it against the surface to hear what it sounds like. And so Chester will take this necklace, for example, and he will he will take it, he will fly away with it, try to hide it for me that he has it, and then smack it against something to see what it sounds like, and then go fly and smack it against something else. Oh so he gosh. does this with whatever he gets his hands on. I have the same necklace, by the way. (laughs) Really? I was actually wearing it and I took it off because I'm like, I'm not going to mix, you know, silver and gold. And then you popped on wearing it and I'm like, I should have kept it on. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Um, Would you say that toucans are destructive? I would say, I would definitely say that toucans are destructive. They are a different- As destructive as parrots? They're just a different kind of destructive because okay. when I was, when I had the, the macaw, it chewed a piece of my mother's door, like a big chunk of wood out of the door in less than 30 seconds. And it chewed part of one of her dining room table, uh, chairs, like the first night it was over for dinner. Oh my gosh. Chester could try as hard as he wants. He's not going to chew through wood. Yeah. But he poops every five to 10 minutes and all the fruits that he eats are different colors and most of them stain. And he will destroy clothing surfaces. Like you have to. I I read and I saw that you posted that like his, okay. He, first of all, poops way more often than a parrot, like every five to 10 minutes. Parrots are like every 15 to 20 So that is a lot more often of pooping. And I saw that you posted that he'll like projectile poop. And I saw that like he did this massive blueberry poop down your door right before you were having guests over. Yep. And everything is white. So of course it stains. And he's just like (laughs) dropping these fruit bombs everywhere. He's an artist for sure. (laughs) Um, 
it, I, it is, I don't know how, but on several occasions, he's managed to poop on the ceiling. How do you fly and poop on the ceiling? What angle of your bird butt do you have to have <laughs> while you're flying for blueberry to end up on the ceiling? And yeah, it's always I, 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 someone make it make sense. Especially with that big beak. He's like, you know, crashing with his beak when he lands. How does he get it on the ceiling? Yeah, he's he's incredibly talented. And um, so he. I would say toucans are very destructive with like, with that sort of thing. Because again, you have to keep in mind that if you have a blueberry poop that is on a surface that is white, that you're trying to clean, you can't go get out some heavy duty cleaning supply and wipe it down. Birds are so sensitive with their respiratory systems to cleaning products. Yeah. So yeah. it's not like it's some easy quick fix. I have to be very thoughtful about what day during the week I'm cleaning, what I'm doing with Chester during this time, making sure there's plenty of ventilation. And even so, sometimes I don't, I'm not able to put something back to how it used to be. Yeah. Like it's, and I think it's, you use vinegar for cleaning, right? 99% of the time I am just using white vinegar and water in a spray bottle. Same, same. It's yeah. the safest. I feel like it's the same vinegar like, is great for everything. Yeah. And it's an, it's a natural, um, uh, what's the word for like not having a smell. Like uh, it it's a smell out of something deodorize. It's deodorizer, a deodorizer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, okay. Well, so he makes a huge mess with his poops mainly, and I can see that your place is spick and spam. How do you keep up like to keep it clean when he's pooping every five minutes? Well, it's, it's definitely tricky during the work day. So I, I work from home. We're together constantly. Um, yeah. but if I'm in the middle of a project and I'm, I'm working, you know, for an hour and a half, maybe and giving him minimal attention during that time, Chester, may have hopped around, gotten into some things, pooped, like hopped and pooped, hopped and pooped, like flown somewhere, pooped and it's landed. It's a lot. Um, that can be rough to clean. Sometimes though, he's like, oh, I'm just going to sit in one spot and poop over and over. Like he loves to sit on my shower curtain rod and poop into the shower and down the shower curtain. So then At least it's like, there well, you can like you know, rinse it down a lot easier. Yeah. It's a little easier there. So it, like that, or like he's in his cage, maybe just taking a nap. That's easier. So it really just depends. Um, it's frustrating when it's on like my couch or one of my chairs, the fabric is a lot harder to clean, especially if it is a deep, very watery blueberry poop, where it's just like immediately seeping in like blueberry or blackberry, where it's that pure dark color. That is super hard to clean. Yeah. Do you have a vessel? I do. I have a, I have a little green machine yeah. and it is very helpful for getting that out. But again, I've got a time when I'm cleaning it. It's like, yeah, I've got company coming over. I've been working all day and Chester's been pooping all over the place. <laughs> Left, right like, and center. And even on the ceiling. <laughs> yeah. There's like, there's only so much I'm going to be able to do. And some people have said to me, well, oh, well don't feed him blueberries or you don't feed him things that stain or keep him in the cage. All of those are things to make my life easier, but give Chester a worse quality of life. Yeah, exactly. Like, you can't be looking for solutions that fit you, but are worse on the, the animal. Yeah. Especially when you sign up for this. If you're signing up for it, yeah, know what you're getting into because yeah, I, Chester's going to keep pooping blue down the wall at inconvenient times or yeah. on the white shirt I was about to wear to meet my boss for lunch. Yeah. And that's just not what I'm going to be wearing anymore. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Um, speaking of like cleanliness and all that kind of stuff, I know that with parrots, it's really recommended to have an air purifier, especially when you have a powder bird. And I also want to know, speaking of powder, non-powder birds after we'll talk about like Chester preening, like does, is it awkward for him to preen? But I also want to know, um, do you need an air purifier when you have a toucan? I know you have a humidifier, but what, tell me. I have two humidifiers and I have an air purifier. Um, okay. It's running constantly. It's in the living room. It's right by his cage. Yeah. Um, the humidifiers, we have one in the bedroom, one in the living room. Um, toucan's respiratory systems, at least from the research I've done, it sounds like they are even more sensitive than parrots. So oh my gosh. you really have to be careful with what you're exposing a, a yeah. pet toucan to. 
it's not the kind of thing you want to skimp on. You want to do everything you can. I had, I had to throw out all my cookware that I had prior to getting Chester because it, you know, a lot of it's nonstick, all my bakeware was not safe. Um, I have to be really careful, like using a hair straightener or blow dryer. Yeah. I make sure it's well ventilated. He's nowhere near it. Yeah. Um, just like parrots. Like sometimes friends will come over with like strong perfumes and I'll have to talk to them about that because if I can smell it when they're coming in the door, like that's, that's a big odor to have around. Yeah. I actually have like a scent free policy. Like I always tell people, like if we're even like my friends and family, I'm like, if you're coming over, we have a scent free space at home. And it's like, sometimes it's so awkward to have that conversation because people love perfume and deodorants and, you know, hairspray and all these different things. But like, I myself am pretty sensitive to scents. I don't know why. And I also in the last like year and a half developed having like asthmatic reactions to like really strong, like chemical smells. Like, you know, those Febreze things, like that oh, yeah. stuff gives me like these asthmatic reactions and I had to get an inhaler. I haven't had to use it. Thank goodness. Um, but yeah, I'm sensitive to it too. And our birds are really sensitive to it. So I always have to like, and even if I'm traveling, I always wear a mask and not because I'm like, oh, you know, like from the pandemic or this and that, but it's mostly so I don't have to smell other people's perfumes and colognes and, you know, it can be very strong. So I, I know sometimes it's like, you have to have that conversation. And I tell people like, if we're meeting up or you're getting in my car, you're coming over, please don't wear perfume. Please don't use cologne. Yeah. You got to take care of the, the animals. Yeah. Yeah. And those smells can be really strong. Um, I actually, I just remembered because we're talking about all this stuff and I was looking at your plant in the back there. Um, I know Chester likes to destroy a lot of your plants and some plants can be toxic. So are you always like really careful of like the plants that you have in your home? When I first decided to get Chester, one of the biggest sacrifices that at least for me, what it felt like a big sacrifice that I had to make was getting rid of my big, beautiful monsteras that I had been growing for more than a year into these gorgeous plants. Oh, I had gosh. multiple of them in my apartment and I was like, I gotta, I gotta give these away. These are as pretty as they are. Monsteras are not safe. Yeah. Uh, so I had, I got rid of all the plants that I had that were not safe. And then I started doing a lot of research into what plants were. So I have fiddle fig, fiddly fig plants, which are safe. I yeah. have polias, which are safe. A couple of others, all, all completely fine. But sometimes I'll see him trying to dig around in soil and that has all sorts of stuff that he yeah. should not be eating either. So then I have to cover the plants, uh, you know, like the soil with like rocks or a towel or something. So he can't go and get into trouble there. So yeah, because you never know what's mindful. in that soil unless you like bought it and it's like bio organic and came from the Amazon. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, you need to be really careful with the soil too. Yeah, exactly. Um, I had asked, oh, when we were talking earlier, I had asked you about when Chester's preening because he has such a big beak. What does that look like? Like, does he preen his whole body? Like Mia right now, for example, she's asking me for scratches on her head and neck. Cause those are areas that she can't get. And usually parrots will help each other out with that. So is it the same with a toucan? So he's preening right now. Cause he just took a bath and he looks a little ridiculous, <laughs> um, but he, he does a good, he does a really good job preening his wings, his back, um, his legs. The beak actually does a good job of getting, getting around to all the areas he can bend and sort of fold in half where his he'll rest his beak on his back to take a nap. So he can, he has pretty good mobility. Um, I preen his, his neck and his head for him and like yeah. right by his ears. And he's always, he's always wanting to be, always wanting to be preened. Does uh, he get pin feathers the same way, like a parrot? Mm -hmm. That's a, the exact same. I'm pretty sure I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure all birds yeah. have, have, yeah, I think um, so. I really have actually never questioned that, but I should probably Google it and find out for sure. <laughs> but I think they all have pen feathers the same way. Um, Chester does his best to preen himself, but especially when I first got him, it seemed like he might have been self-harming or like stress plucking in the bird yeah, store. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that because you did write, I think, in one of your blogs that there isn't much data out there about toucans plucking 
and there hasn't really been like much stuff online about toucans actually plucking where it can be very popular with parrots, especially ones that are stressed and anxious, trauma. Yeah, I think it's more likely that there just isn't enough data. Okay. Because when I originally was researching, one of the positive, like one of the pros that I found about toucans is they don't, they don't stress pluck. And I don't think that's true because Chester did not have a tail when I got him. Like when I first met him there, was, he did not have a tail. And I asked the store owner about it and he's, his answer was very, I don't know, do dodgy. It wasn't very clear if he had, if Chester had pulled the feathers out himself or what, but after about one cycle of feathers growing back and Chester like pulling on them and blood feather, like breaking a blood feather and then me having to take him to the vet a bunch. After one cycle of that, owning him, he then stopped doing it and he's never, he's never tried to pull tail feathers out again. So he seems to, I mean, now his tail feathers are big and long and beautiful, but yeah. I do think he had some sort of amount of stress in the bird yeah. store for that year. He was in the cage Absolutely. that he was, he was stress plucking. So I really just think there's not enough data out there. And it's likely that any bird that you stick in a stressful anxiety inducing situation is going to do something similar. It's just like dogs and cats. There are tons of reported pets that are stressed and anxious and hurt themselves in one way or another. Yeah, absolutely. Um, speaking of vets, uh, I wanted to ask you, I know that, you know, one of the major health concerns with toucans, as you mentioned, was the low iron and diabetes. Is there any other like major health concerns or things like, do you take him for like an annual checkup every year? Or like, do you go every six months? Like what do vet checkups look like? with a toucan and do you see an avian vet specifically? Chester has never let me get long enough without a vet visit that we are going for an annual or semi-annual appointment. Oh he finds God. a way to bring us to the vet frequently. He is great really? at hurting himself. <laughs> is it because he's clumsy or it's is because it because toucans are like so specific? He's incredibly clumsy. This, okay. is, this is all him. So um, your vet knows you guys really well. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> and it's do. an avian vet, right? It's an avian vet. So I go to um, a place called Pender Exotics um, that have like spe specific exotic vets. Um, no vet I've ever been to though locally, even the ones who are exotics and deal with exotic birds really know a ton about toucans. They might've seen a toucan before, but I just don't think there's a ton of yeah. research or awareness around that. So I imagine there it's was... hard to find like an avian vet for a toucan. Right. Yeah. It's, it's just really not that, not that common where somebody's yeah. going to have seen so many toucans that they can really specialize in toucans specifically. There was, there was a time where Chester flew into my KitchenAid mixer and the bottom part of his beak about like, I don't know, maybe a centimeter worth of it had broken off and was dangling and it was bleeding and I freaked out and took him into the vet that was by the way our second visit to the vet that day so he was really finding in the middle of my work day too really finding ways to hurt himself um the oh first one was a check God. on another injury he had that was healing and the vet even said we hope we don't see you for a long time <laughs> and within 10 minutes of getting home Chester has hurt himself and we have to go back oh my word but I remember like being at the vet and looking at Chester's, like I had put, I had put some cornstarch to try to like, just stop the bleeding yeah. while we're on this 45 minute drive to the vet. Cause it's far, it's, there's nothing oh, nearby. Shoot. And so I've stopped his bleeding and I'm like, oh God, he's gotta be in so much pain. Like this is like part of his beak. Like there's so much sensitivity within the beak. Um, they regulate temperature through it. They have sensation in it. Like they're feeling with this. It's a big part of their, their body function. And when I was looking at it, once the bleeding stopped, I was like, oh, there's this little pink sort of stringy piece sticking out of where the beak has broken off. And in my head, I was like, this looks like it's some sort of nerve or some sort of muscle or something connected to the beak oh that God. is significant. And when his vet took a look at him and they like were looking at the beak and deciding what to do, I brought up this part. I'm like, you see this thing? I think this is some sort of nerve or something. And the vet said, no, I really think it's just part of like the beak that's just sticking out. Like, I don't, I don't think it is anything, whatever. They end up snipping it, cauterizing it. And that part of his beak has never grown back. 
And I don't remember if it was that day or the next time I saw the vet, but they were like, oh, we found out, yes, it was some sort of internal part of, of the beak that got snipped. Um, which I mean, I guess there wasn't another way they could have handled that. You probably need to snip it regardless. So it's not sticking out and sensitive. Like that would have probably sucked more for him. Yeah. But it, it sucked for me knowing that like, they didn't have enough knowledge to make a very, very informed call on what to do. Yeah. And he now doesn't really have an ability to grow back that, that part of the bottom. Yeah. Beak. That's he figured tough. out how to eat in less than a day. Like he had figured out how to adjust his eating. He was a little clumsy at first to try and like get a pellet and couldn't figure out like the, the, yeah. the, the top part was like farther out than the bottom, but he figured it out quickly. He's never ever seemed like he has been inconvenienced by his own injuries. He just adapts. It's really incredible. He's wow. very good at adapting. Yeah. Would you say that toucans are more difficult pets than parrots? I would say yes. Uh, I would I would say because from personal experience. Yeah, I would say that because there's less research, there are fewer forums, uh, yeah. fewer experts. You're already at a disadvantage. So your vet bills are going to be higher. The number Do of they charge people. you more because it's a toucan instead of a parrot? No, but they Chester has to get all this special blood testing because of iron, because of possible diabetes, because of all the ways that they could have some sort of issues. It's a lot of it's a lot of different testing that has to get done. Oh my God. And maybe you do that for parrots too, but um I would say that their diets are so specific and it's so much fruit and you can't make chop. Like I know a lot of people who have parrots, they do like big batches of chop or they'll freeze stuff. Everything's yeah. going to be like fresh, exotic fruit, like lots of papaya. That's a big piece of their diet. Yeah. So you've got to find good quality exotic fruit for them. Yeah. Um, How many times you, a day do they eat? I was actually just about to say, and you can't just feed them once because the fruit starts to get um, spoiled. So yeah. I give him fruit two to three times a day. Okay. Through, like, and he eats all day. He eats the entire day. He's always eating. He's always going back and getting another piece of fruit and trying to feed it to me. Yeah. So <laughs> my partner. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say, and then also just like the cage requirements and the fact that the I maybe this this would just be my guess based on the types of people that might be listening to a, a parrot related podcast. But the kind of joy that a parrot will bring you through their shenanigans and their excitement about music or their ability to mimic things, whatever it is. It's just such a separate set of behaviors than a toucan. Yeah. And I think people are likely to find less joy out of a toucan than a parrot, unless you really understand and appreciate the toucan behaviors, because it is a different way that they exist, a different way that they play or have fun or experience the world. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I just have noticed such a, such a difference in all the parrots I've interacted with. And then all the videos I've seen of toucans, the other owners who have toucans, they are, it is a sweet and beautiful, special relationship to love a toucan and have a toucan that loves you. But I don't think it's as fun as having a parrot, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I also, for anybody who's listening, want to note that it's also not for everybody, you know, like that's why I think the research part is so important because birds overall are difficult pets and, you know, these are tropical undomesticated pets and it's not going to be for everybody. And so, I don't want somebody to be listening to this and be like, oh my gosh, toucan sounds so awesome and fun and their bites don't hurt. I want to get a toucan. And you know, it's just important to, I think, really understand what it is to have a toucan or to have a parrot and like how complex their care requirements are, what they need, the socialization, the diet, the vet bills, all that stuff. Like it's important. It adds up and it's being a parent or a toucan mom is literally life-changing. It changes your whole life. <laughs> it's yeah, I completely agree. It, it's the kind of thing where 
if and I, I don't mean this to shame anybody who does this, but in my personal opinion, if you're going to have a pet bird and you don't have someone at home with the bird all day, you can't leave the bird all day at home alone while you go and, and like make a living. Like, I think there are a lot of people who leave pets alone to go do their lives. And I just think that that you're really putting the animal at such, such a dis disadvantage where they're stuck in a cage. You're their whole life. They're waiting for you. I know yeah. I'm one person responsible for Chester. I have been very clear with my company and with any future places I might work at. I will not go into an office. I will not do something that's taking me away from him because I am his world. When I walk out of here to go buy something, see a friend socialize, it breaks my heart every time. And he is upset and it is clear. And he knows every single possible symptom or sign of me getting ready to leave because he's memorized them because he does not want me to go. Yeah. He does not want to be stuck in a cage until I come home at some eventual time. It's not a, it, it's the kind of thing where I think a lot of people don't really process, like you might have a really special bond, especially if you're lonely, getting a, a pet bird that can just love you unconditionally, but then you're that animal's whole world. And when you walk outside and you leave them behind to go do something, you have a life outside of there, but they don't have a life without you. And yeah. so I, I'm very, I'm very passionate about making sure you have the right sort of lifestyle for any sort of pet at all, but especially birds, because they're just so emotionally intelligent and need so much engagement. Um, you know, you need to have a partner or family or somebody else, if you're going to go and ha have that whole life outside of your home. Yeah. And I think that like when we're also walking out that door, they don't know how long we're leaving for. They don't know where we're going. We can't really explain that to them. They just know that we're going and they're hoping that we come back. But I think that like working from home helps a lot. It makes a huge difference. I also think, like you said, like you have to really look at your lifestyle. Like, is there a partner? Like I have my husband. So if I go out, my husband's home or if my husband goes out, you know, I'm home. And if we go out for dinner, you know, like with Mia, she also has like, she'll be in her cage, but like our dog is walking around. So she like sees him, but I also always like create foraging opportunities. So she has things to do, you know, I'll set up like a webcam, a webcam, a pet cam so that I can like, you know, check in and make sure that she's okay. And it's like, as you know, a pet parent, like you're always thinking about them and you're worrying about them and like leaving for long periods of time is really difficult and it's really difficult on them. And yeah, we need to like really consider like, do you have a family? Is there going to be different people that are able to care for your bird? Or like, if you're going to want to go on vacation, like, is there going to be someone else that they're comfortable and familiar and happy with? So it's definitely a lot of things to consider. And like with parrots, sometimes people will get pairs or they'll get like a flock. And so it's a lot easier when there's a flock, I think, from speaking with other parents that, you know, going out for like an extended period of time, you need to go groceries and run errands and all these different things. But with two cans, do they do well in pairs? Like, have you ever thought about getting a second two can for Chester? And what would that look like? It's a question I get asked a lot. And if this were me getting him as a baby and the circumstances being very different, I would, I would get two because it's nice to have, you know, somebody, you know, to be in a pair, but Chester's scared of birds. Yeah. He thinks I'm his that partner. I think, he'd, I think he'd kill the other one. I don't think, yeah. I think it would be a really rough situation trying to have two of them coexist. Yeah. And from some of my other toucan friends, I see some who are really successful with a male and female being like coexisting together and getting along. But then I also see somewhere only one of them can be allowed out of the cage at, at the time because they're violent towards each other. And that to me just seems like, I don't know. I, yeah, this is a very unique situation with Chester. Yeah. Um, I don't feel like he's the kind of, pet that could handle another yeah. pet whether that's competition or what have you or fear I just I don't I don't think that would make things better I think that would make things worse yeah absolutely like, he seems to thrive being just with you and having a fear of birds and not thinking that he's a bird also doesn't help 
<laughs> yeah. And we, the relationship we have alone in my apartment is so different than the way he behaves when other people are over, when we're out in the world. Like we have a very different life when it's just the two of us in our home together than when other people are in the mix. So also on the dating front, I mean, I'm, I was partnered when I first got Chester. I'm not partnered now. I don't know how I would in incorporate somebody new into this because I never want Chester to feel like he's not my partner. I never want him to feel like there's somebody else who's getting more attention than him. And I think talking to, you know, some people and dating a bit, it's like Chester has to believe he's the center of the universe. Yeah, It's not an afterthought sort of pet. Chester needs to feel important and like, this because of Chester, you are not single and ready to mingle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you so had a date funny. come over, he'd be like, I'm taking your eye out. You're never going to see her again. She's mine. I, I have had a couple of people who have slept over and Chester screams in the morning, like, why are they here? Get them out. You are not welcome like go home. Like Chester will, oh, he'll have God. a certain number of hours. And then he's like, I'm done with this. Why is this person here? Oh my gosh. I'm surprised <laughs> that he doesn't like come out of his like little sleeping hut and like dive bomb their <laughs> eyes. There's a first time for everything. It <laughs> it might happen. <laughs> oh my gosh. When you were, when you first got Chester and you had a partner, did he like your partner or mm -hmm. accept him? Not at not at first. Uh, the, the bond for them really grew when I would leave town for like work trips or something. And then my partner would stay and sleep over and be there for like several days in a row with Chester. And then because of that, they were able to grow their bond and Chester would, would miss him and be happy that he was there and like be happy to see him in the morning when they woke up. Um, so the bond was definitely grown through that sort of, that sort of encounter. And so I think if, if somebody stuck around, like if I really did meet somebody I wanted to have a long-term relationship with, I think it would work because it would be the kind of person who also understands the dynamic yeah. and be okay with it. But all the time when I go to bed they'd at night- They'd have to be a bird lover. They'd have to be a bird lover, but they'd also have to be okay always coming second to, uh, to Chester. Um, so all the handsome fellas, if you're listening and you're interested in Maria, take notes. <laughs> Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's interesting for sure. Yeah. Um, I wanted to circle back to the vet because I had another question and of course we talked about a million other things. Um, what was like the most scariest reason or like thing that happened, like your biggest scare that you ended up at the vets with him? Probably the the time I already talked about with his his beak breaking off when he flew into a KitchenAid mixer was the scariest. Okay. Thing okay. It, 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 yeah, part of a beak dangling. Yeah. That was that was frightening, and that was also a lot of blood, and I didn't know what the vet was going to be able to do about it. Um, the hardest thing for me, though, ever emotionally at the vet, is when we went in. He had like broken a toe. The vet tried to fix. He broke a toe at the vet. The vet tried to fix it by wrapping and bandaging his foot. I saw he had a bandaged foot on Instagram. And I, I was asking this because he also you also had posted about um a scary moment you had at the vet, but I'll let you finish. Um, yeah, and there's like a whole highlight of our vet experience that you can go through on on Instagram where it like I think it's literally called vet, but um like a story highlight. But um he had had his foot bandaged a couple times and the vet was really trying to like have a bandage that would stay that would secure the toe so it could maybe straighten out and the bone could heal. Um, and so what we tried a little over a year ago was a bandage that went from his toe all the way up his leg. And they wanted me to keep this on for at least a month. And I asked them at the time, how is this going to work? Chester bathes himself every day. That doesn't yeah. seem like a good idea. And they said, well, you know, just make sure that it like his leg stays dry. It'll dry out. It should be fine. Whatever. It was about two and a half weeks of the bandage on. And I was like, I'm not feeling good about this. The bandage keeps getting soggy. Like, I don't, I don't like that. This is all the way up his leg. He's got a tiny little chicken leg with like the tiniest bit of meat on him. Yeah. No feathers and fluff. He's not, he does not have some like thick, chunky leg. So I took him into the vet and I was like, I want to take this bandage off. 
so they unwrap the bandage and as they're pulling off of the leg part his skin is like ripped open because it had been so soggy that it's like if you wore a band-aid for too long or something and your skin starts to get just more yeah it, it malleable so he, it ripped it ripped his leg open and he made this cry that was like I, he'd never make it a sound like that before let alone made a sound like that in public because he's very shy and he made he let out this cry this like scream out of pain and I was like oh my god this is the worst thing ever worse than and, his beak yeah because he never made a noise about the beak he acted yeah. like he was nothing this was like oh he's in pain he is in real pain to be making this sound so that was the hardest vet visit I've had where we were just going in because I did not want that bandage on him anymore I did not think it was a, I just, I, I had a feeling that he, that he could not possibly be bathing this much. And it's good to have one bandage on a leg. And I couldn't change it myself because of the way it had been wrapped. So yeah, they had to stitch his leg up then. Oh and they were gosh. like, you know what? We're going to just let the toe be the way it is. <laughs> Let's gosh. just try to let this leg heal now and stop messing. Like they basically decided less is more with Chester. If he hurts himself, maybe just let him exist with the injury rather than doing more things to try to correct it. Yeah. And that has honestly seemed to be the best route. Um, Cause since, since then he's been, he's been fine. Yeah. So he had broken his toe out at a vet. And then I think a few days later, I saw one of your posts that you were at the vet again, because you thought that he ate your earring. Oh my God. And it ended up just being like a respiratory infection. How the heck? What the heck? I actually, if you, if you want to know the grossest thing I've ever done for this bird. Tell me uh, right now. I need two, to know. Two Thanksgivings ago was the first time he went on an airplane and we flew to Atlanta to see my mom and my family. And I think he must have caught a cold from the airplane. It was cold. <gasps> it was November. And we were a couple days into being home and I could hear him breathing. And anybody who owns a bird knows if you can hear your animal breathing, that's not a good, that's not a good sign. Their yeah. respiratory systems are so sensitive. Oh, hi, Chester. Hello. We have a blueberry. Oh, thank you. He's so cute. Does he, he like to... make you like pretend to eat it before he eats it? He's like, yeah. I'm making sure I'm sharing it with you because I yeah. love you. How Yum, adorable. You. What a sweetheart. Okay, and a gentleman. I'm going to eat it. Thank you. <laughs> you, just got, you can He's just it. holding it. <laughs> Are you going to eat the blueberry? <laughs> the googly eyes. I'm obsessed. Chester, you're going to eat the blueberry. It's so yummy. He's showcasing yeah. it. Oh, oh, just drop it? <laughs> Babes, come on. Oh, okay. He is just showcasing it. Yeah. <laughs> crazy I thought they eye. were your favorite. What are you doing? When he was flying on Delta, was he in cabin or in cargo? He was in cabin uh, and under the seat in front of him in a very nice um, carrier that my my mom's boyfriend got as a, a gift for, for oh me gosh. and Chester. And it is a very nice carrier. I think the brand is like, I don't know how to pronounce it, like Celti, like C-E-L-L-T-E-I or something. It's amazing yeah. for TSA. Yeah, I, I've seen those ones and they're like airline approved. Yeah, they're they're yeah. great. They, they smush just... down. Yeah. For, for the record, for anybody listening, Delta is an airline that allows birds in cabin, but on domestic flights within the United States. And you have to, you have to make sure they don't already have. Oh my God. She's on my leg preening and I look down and I have a present. That's I so get to add it to my collection. Oh my God. You have a jar. That's so smart. I have like Ziploc bags of different sizes of feathers. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, I also have her first ever mold with us and I've labeled it cutie angel feathers. Look how oh small they are. Oh my gosh, that's so precious. Yeah, so we're going to add this present. Thank you, Mia. We're going to add this so present. She just pops right on. <laughs> okay, we got super distracted. He got a respiratory infection in cabin. So I I was at home a couple days into being there and... I was saying to my mom and sisters, I was like, I think something's wrong with Chester's breathing. I think he has a respiratory infection because I can hear him breathing. And I, I put my flashlight up to his little nostrils, which are on the, the top of his beak right yeah. here. 
and there was fluid inside of it. And I could just see like a little bit of fluid, like, you know, kind of like if you've got snot or something. And so I asked my mom if she had any sort of um, like the little squeegee thing you use on a baby to get snot out or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And she was like, no, I don't have anything like that. I was like, do we have a syringe? Do we have anything like something I could like pull this out of? Because I was very worried about his active ability to breathe based on how loud it was. And we didn't have anything. So I grabbed him. I grabbed him by the beak. I put my mouth over his nose and I sucked as hard as I could until the snot came out of his little nostril. <laughs> and then his breathing was fine. And I took him, I took him to the vet immediately. I found a vet in Atlanta locally that could see him and had seen two cans. And the vet was like, yep, this is absolutely a respiratory infection. You caught it early. We've got antibiotics. Like he'll be good. Um, That's love. How did it taste? It, I didn't, I just, I sucked enough until it like shot out of the top. I didn't like swallow it. Um, I will say, however, though, that I ended up with an upper respiratory infection a few days later. So I am convinced that I, I had looked it up and it's like, can humans get colds from birds? And it's like, not unless you ingest their mucus, but it got on your tongue. You must've swallowed a bit. Holy, holy moly. I'm flabbergasted. I'm flabbergasted. First of all, that is love. And yes, that is the grossest thing, (laughs) but that's a mom for, yeah, we'll do anything for our babies anything you look at his little face right now he just wants oh, to be oh my goodness does he love getting like beak rubs oh yeah oh yeah he loves he has so much so much sensation in his beak so yeah actually speaking of beaks i had done some research and you mentioned this that a toucan's beak serves a thermal regulatory function the blood vessels in their beaks help regulate their body temperature by dissipating excess heat when the bird becomes too warm or conserving heat and cooler temperatures. Yeah. That is so interesting. How cool. Their beaks serve lots of different functions. I saw that, um, what else did it, that they have edges on a toucan's beak that are often yeah. serrated or saw-like. And this adaptation helps toucans grip and manipulate food more effectively, especially when feeding on fruits or small prey. Yeah. They <laughs> use their beaks for feeding, defense, social interactions, so those beaks do a lot. And I also saw that in the winter, you put coconut oil on his beak and on his feet to moisturize them. Oh yeah. Every yeah. day to keep it. Tropical you know, we've birds. Also, we've got the humidifiers going all the time. Um, but yeah, I also put coconut oil on just to try to make sure he doesn't get dried out. You do um, that mostly in the winter or all year round? Honestly, well, the humidifiers mostly in the winter but the coconut oil all year round because I have air conditioning in the summer and I think that the oh, cold air right. also blows, blows a yeah. lot. But we really, we sleep cold at night. Um, but during the day I, in the summer, I usually let it get up to, you know, 85 or something in here and just let him enjoy the tropical temperatures. Yeah. Do you get worried ever like with the air conditioning that like he might catch a cold or like a respiratory infection or? Well, since with the air conditioning, it's, at night and he's inside his little nest like a little hut I think it's not like it's directly blowing on him or something um he's I mean it's never happened I'm always though very cautious if he sounds like he even slightly breathes weird yeah so yeah you you catch it early I'm the same way as soon as I think like something's wrong I'm like we need to go to the vet luckily (laughs) we haven't had really any situations like that but um what do you think it was in cabin I think it was the, it was the air temperature. I think it was, it was cold and it was, um, his first time on an airplane and, and I just he's think been it, twice now, right? Yeah. So he's had a total of four flights cause he's gone okay. home twice to Atlanta, um, for Thanksgiving. So he's gone on four flights. I really think it was just a chilly day, both in DC and in Atlanta. So I think it was just a lot of cold air and yeah, I think it, I think he just caught a cold. And on the other three flights, he was totally fine. Yeah. And he, he's super quiet. Um, he doesn't make any noise again. He, he's very shy. So he's just like quiet and chilling. Um, I do think he got maybe dehydrated on our last flight because he wouldn't, he didn't poop the whole time and it scared the crap out of me, no pun intended. And I took him into one of like the family bathrooms 
uh, before our, our flight or after a flight or something, I, don't know. I took him into a family bathroom and like, let him loose. And I was like, please poop, like fly around, do something like you poop every five minutes. You haven't pooped in like an hour and a half. This is scaring me. Oh my like, is gosh. something wrong with you? And then I think he just drank a ton of water. And so I think maybe he just like was dehydrated and so he couldn't poop. I don't know. Oh my goodness. Travel affects everybody. Yeah. Um, before I ask you a few more questions and then we'll start to wrap things up because I know that the time is just getting away from us. We're having so much fun. Um, Tell us how can everybody find you on social media and your website? So the website is just chester, the And if you go there, it also has links to social, um, Chester is on Instagram and TikTok. Those are the two main platforms. So that's just Chester the Toucan with underscores. So Chester underscore the underscore Toucan. Um, he's most popular on TikTok, but I would say I post more on Instagram just because I can do pictures, stories. It's an easier platform for me. Um, but yeah, he's he's got a lot of content, um, a lot of a lot of interesting shenanigans all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the reel that you posted that stands out to me the most is that he hates shoes and his poops they literally look like the fruit he just swallowed it it just got mushed up and came out his butt <laughs> yeah a lot of people in the comments for that were saying this makes sense because they're basically dispersing the fruit seeds everywhere yeah like in the wild like that's something that i guess is helpful kind of like they're pollinators like bees I don't yeah know. yeah they help the um, amazon but I also wanted to say, in addition to his social platforms and website, if you want, you can you can book him on uh, Cameo if you want a personal Cameo with Chester. Ooh. They're the most unhinged Cameos, though, because I cannot get him to stay still or focus. So they're very unhinged, but. <laughs> that is good. awesome. I love it. Um, <laughs> speaking of eating, I just wanted to quickly know, how does he eat the pellets? Like the same way that he eats the fruit? Yeah, he's like a, I always call him my little maraca because he just like takes them and like goes like opens his beak really quick back and forth. Um, and it's, it makes this cute little sound. And then he just chucks it in the back of his throat. Oh my gosh. Are the pellets big or small? They're very little. They're like, I'm trying to think of what to compare it to. Like, like a, a Skittle like a, or a, like a an grain of rice. It's like a grain of rice size, but like oh, a little, a little that's bit That's really thicker. smaller than I thought. I thought they'd be like a blueberry size. Um. Okay, I'm going to ask you some fun questions. If Chester could turn invisible, what pranks do you think that he would pull on you? Oh, my God. <laughs> You're like, the list goes on and on and on. <laughs> what pranks would Chester pull on me? Um, he would bite my toes. He would sneak attack and bite my toes. He would come at me from every angle because he hates. I think it really bothers him that I've learned his movements well enough that I can dodge him when he's yeah. coming from my feet. <laughs> He would absolutely be sneak attacking and biting my toes. Oh my gosh. Okay. If Chester was a, the star of a movie, what kind of movie do you think that it would be? It would be a horror movie. He would be. He... I was not <laughs> expecting that. <laughs> oh my Chester gosh. He just has, he just has a way and I love him to death. I adore him, but he gives me. Like when he preens his wings, I always say that they're like his Dracula wings. He just has this like sort of dark cloak around him. When he doesn't like something, he his eyes like turn into little pins and get very scary looking. And he just looks like he's like ready to murder you. And he has so many things that he irrationally hates that he's just decided are, are evil or that I'm not allowed to touch. And he's going to bite and attack if I uh, touch any of the 400 things on this list. So I just feel like Chester too. would really thrive as either like a villain or like the main scary thing in a horror movie that's like waiting like around and scream. To get you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. If Chester was a professional athlete, what sport do you think he would do well in? I guess like baseball or basketball, something where you're catching you're catching mm. a ball coming at you because I'll chuck blueberries at him or we have like little wiffle balls. Um, sometimes beauty blenders, I'll throw things at him and he's very good at catching despite the big beak in front of him in the way oh of his my. eyes, he's able to catch very well. Wow. Chester, I'm rooting for you. All right. If Chester was a detective, what mystery do you think he would solve? 
<laughs> Where are all the papayas? <laughs> If she was a detective, what mystery would he... Now, is this a mystery in the world or a mystery in Chester's head? In Chester's head. I think his his question would probably be, where does the poop go? Because I, every morning, I have him... Because you know how the first bird morning poop of the day is yeah. always... Yeah. So I'll always, like, put him on my arm and have him perch over the toilet and, like, try to get him to do his first poop in the toilet. And then when he's done, I flush the toilet in front of him and he turns his head to the side to look with his eye and he looks at it so confused about where it's going. I think he'd probably want to understand the function of a toilet and know where does the poop go? <laughs> and why does um, mom keep collecting it? Why does she want so much of it? Why is she so <laughs> invested in where I'm pooping all the time? Oh my gosh, I love it. And I have to also ask, I know like parrots are my favorite thing to smell in the world. Like I love coffee and I'm always like smelling coffee, but when I am smelling Mia, I'm like, like inhaling, like a crazy person. My husband's always like, are you <laughs> like, what are you doing? I'm like, she smells so good. Do toucans smell amazing? Oh my God. Toucans have such an intoxicating smell. And it's not like if you just sniff them, like, you know, you know what I mean? You got to like stick your face into the feathers yeah. but it's right around his neck area. And if I, if I stick my nose in there, it's like, some people have described it for toucans as like, if they smell like spices to me, and this is so specific, but it smells like a wicker basket in the rain. I don't know how to explain it, but I thought you were going to say like a tropical smoothie of some sort. He does not smell like fruit. He smells like this sort of like musky spicy I don't really know I I feel like it could but be amazing a scent it's an amazing it's an amazing smell he smells delicious it is what everybody I've ever talked to <laughs> quotes you know about the smell of their their toucan is that it's delicious or intoxicating okay I love it okay last question and it's up to you if you want to answer it but I'm curious and I want to know like how much does a toucan cost so Chester is used. So I think it's different than if you get a baby to from can, like a breeder. From a breeder, yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure the average cost of a toucan though is about five thousand. Chester's original price was forty five hundred, and I talked to the owner down to doing it for three grand. So Holy. I got him for three thousand that dollars. That's like a lot more expensive I feel like than parrots but at the mm -hmm. same time I also think that it's good that they have such a high price point because it'll deter people from getting them as much as pet like as often as pets and giving them everything that they need and actually like be serious about them and their care and like you know giving them a full and enriching life yeah I I agree I mean I hope anybody who's going to invest that much in an animal is really going to have done their research before. Yeah, absolutely. And like, as like, because toucans are, I feel like such a rare pet in comparison to parrots, like, is it, it's legal. There's breeders. It's, it's just super unregulated. It's another, you know, like tiger King sort of issue. Like why, yeah. why is this allowed? Why are people allowed to have them as pets? Why is there no sort of license you need or like, there should be like background checks or like licenses, like you said, like something in order to like, you know, if someone's adopting a child, there's like all this background check that they do. Like, can you financially support this child? Do you have a good home and all these different things? But with pets, it's like, you can just buy them. It's just a business, you know? It's and very scary. And it, it, I mean, I, every time I go into a bird store, it breaks my heart, not just for like the birds stuck in the cages, but I hear conversations people are having about, you know, some Indian ring neck they're waiting for like the babies to breed so they can buy one. And I'm just thinking, I bet you saw a video on TikTok of an Indian ring neck doing something funny, looked it up and decided you're going to get this bird. And beyond that, you have not done research into all the requirements and what it's going to be like. And that birds don't necessarily perform like you see in a video. Like yeah. it could be a bird that doesn't talk at all and doesn't want to do anything interesting like you have to still love it and exactly. it's, it's just it's horrible I don't know I really think 
again, this is going to sound super like elitist or like, you know, saying, oh, like we're, we're better than others. But I think most people are not cut out to be bird owners. I think birds, especially anything with emotional intelligence and that need a lot of enriching activities. I don't think most people have the capacity to really give them the lives they deserve to be fulfilled better or to the same as they would be if they were out in the wild. Yeah, a hundred percent. And that's, you know, something that we're also trying to spread awareness about like, with the podcast and with our content as well and showing like the bad sides of having parrots. Cause it's not always all fun and games and all cute and tricks and things like that. And I always talk about how you want to do your research to see how you can mimic the wild into your home, like having tree stands and, you know, the type of plants that they would interact with in the jungle and like, you know, having their diet as close to nature intended as possible and all of these different different things. So yeah, that's why we're here. We're trying to spread that. And I know that on your website, you talk about this a lot and you're trying to spread as much information about two cans as possible. So I'm so grateful for your time today. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode and telling us everything there is to know about two cans. I know that this episode was really insightful and informative for a lot of people. And I sure learned a lot about two cans and Chester and I'm in love with him. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much for having us and for putting up with Chester's random attention seeking <laughs> behaviors during this call. <laughs> thank you again. Uh, this was this was great. Um, very honored to get to be on your podcast and to give some information about what it's like to own a toucan. Yeah. And hopefully anybody who's thinking about getting a toucan or was thinking about a toucan, this helps them make their decision and make like an educated decision on like the care requirements and what they're actually like and how different they can be from parrots. They have some similarities, but I think they're more different than similar, to be honest. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in to the Pair Podcast. I'm your host, Sandra, and I hope that you loved this episode to contango to can play that game where were these when i was talking to maria but don't forget to go follow maria and chester on instagram and tiktok chester the toucan and you can also jump on their website she's written a lot of really great blogs and there's also really great helpful information on there and yeah, I hope that if you are interested in toucans, you learned a lot in this episode, or if you're looking to learn more about toucans, that this was very insightful for you and really helps you get to know toucans. Oh, and one more thing. This podcast is presented solely for educational and entertainment purposes. I'm not a licensed avian vet, behaviorist, or professional expert in parrots or toucans. The information provided is not intended as a substitute for professional advice from a qualified avian vet, trainer, or behaviorist. Please consult with a specialist for personalized guidance on your specific situation. 